Harry. I'm just getting on to Harry now I just have a lot of opinions. <laughs> Hi and welcome to Quality, the segment where I'm joined by someone and we discuss all things bookish. Today I'm joined by Imogen <laughs> and we are going to discuss the Harry Potter and the Cursed Child. The play. So basically I've been to see it, we've both been to see it and I went before it was the book was out, so in the previews, and um, I had no idea what anything about the plot. I had no spoilers. I went in knowing absolutely nothing. Um, I read the book uh, on the thirty first. I went to a midnight uh, release party, and then managed to bag some surprise tickets three weeks after. So I went in having already known everything about the plot, and was purely focusing on things like costumes and set, that thing that I wouldn't know about and wouldn't have got from the actual script form. So. We both had a very different experience and we thought we'd like to share with you today. So uh, our immediate reactions were quite different. Um, I had a few issues with the book, mainly plot, seemed to contradict the canon that I know from the original Potter novels, uh, mainly like Time Turners and Delphi's entire existence. <laughs> And some things, some characters seemed really out of character, especially people like Ron and Harry. Um, when I went and saw the play, a lot of my reactions to that were completely changed. I agreed with Harry's characterisation and with Ron, and I actually genuinely really enjoyed it. And I'm actually, I actually really like it now. So. Um, since the only spoiler or anything I knew about it was that Harry was afraid of pigeons, <laughs> that meant that I was so focused on the plot and everything that was happening and I couldn't, I just was taking everything in at once so I didn't really focus on like specific details like Imogen could and because of this I, I noticed some things in the plot which I wasn't really a fan of but I was so overwhelmed with the whole experience yeah. I didn't really pick up on like major or like non-canon kind of characterization mm -hmm. as much as I would have if I kind of poured over the script like I know many people have. Mm -hmm. You definitely can completely miss over everything else because you're just completely amazed and completely distracted by yeah. the magic and everything. Although, it's great. obviously a few of the things I was like, for example, the trolley lady, I was like, what is I going love on? The trolley lady. What? <laughs> <laughs> I love that scene. But the fact that she just appears out of nowhere, she's like, oh yeah, I'm a magical with really like no, it just like it just seems like something that JK Rowling had had in her head for ages and then just was like, oh yeah, the trolley witch is like a protector of I know I don't know what's expressed. When I first saw her, I was like, what is going on? I don't know if yeah. like, people next to me were like Seeing what I'm seeing is that's like actually happening. It was weirder watching it than it was yeah, reading definitely, it. Yeah, definitely, hundred percent. The, the claws and everything. The claws yeah, yeah. actually aren't that well done, in my opinion. Do you know what I mean? I think I think it was. I don't. Know, you could see it. It was kind of like Wolverine. <laughs> <laughs> it was really weird, but I loved it. It was it was the weirdest I, part of the play, so I wasn't I was. particularly bothered. But um, as, so obviously, because I didn't know it was going to happen, so when it did happen, <laughs> I was like. <gasps> about the one reading the script because I'd read I'd read very spoilers mm. because I just couldn't contain myself after waiting so many years. So you mentioned that you felt like some of the characters were a bit off when you read the script. Mm -hmm. Would you say that changed with you sort of play? Entirely changed, entirely. Um, I know a lot of people will share this opinion, but Ron reading it in the script format seemed incredibly blunt and incredibly just just basically just used for comic relief mm -hmm. and it, it really annoyed me because I think that's the stereotype that really goes along with Ron in the movies so I really didn't like it because I felt like in the books Ron always had a genuine contribution to the trio like he, yeah. he was the he was almost the heart of the trio and it really annoyed me that he was kind of just reduced to that and that he was almost just put to the side and didn't really have any attention because obviously you know Ron Hermione and Harry are both in positions of power, so it really just felt like Ron, or he runs this joke shop, you know, and he's just a bit of a comedian, he doesn't, mm. he doesn't actually care about the serious situation that they've put themselves in, so he seemed really insensitive, and watching it, yeah. oh my god, the delivery, the Paul, I think he's called Paul Thornley, yeah, yeah. Like, he's incredible, yes. Ron. absolutely incredible, he's just what you imagine, he's so much like Book Ron, even just his physical appearance, it's Book mm -hmm. Ron, um, and he's so funny, and 
Because when I, I found him hilarious and I really, really enjoyed his characterization and then I went online and everyone was like, oh, Ron was ruined, I hated yeah. Ron. And I was like, he was I, brilliant. I actually rem remember you telling me after I'd read the script, you was like, oh, I loved, no, it was after you just watched it. Yeah. I was like, oh, yeah, yeah. I loved Ron. And I'd seen that everyone was like complaining that Ron was just kind of this, you know, comedic, just used for yeah, comedic yeah. stuff. And I, and I was like, and I'd read the script and I was like, how did Eleanor think that? Yeah, And exactly. then I watched the play and I completely it's, understood. The thing is, with the play, it's all about how the character, uh, how the actors even interpret the characters. Mm -hmm. Like, that's so important um, because you just, with a play, you don't get the same emotion which yeah. you do on stage. I mean, Paul Thornley completely owns the stage. As soon as he walks yeah. on, everyone is looking at Ron because you know he's going to come out with something completely yeah. hilarious. And he just... His, the way that he portrays it, he's, he really seems like his contribution is trying to keep everyone's hopes up because mm. it's a pretty dim situation. <laughs> yeah. Um, but his stage pre presence is different to kind of Harry's stage presence mm -hmm. um, because Harry's, you know, Harry Potter, he's a savior, he's his aura, he kind of commands this, whereas Ron comes on and he doesn't command the presence in the same way, it's more like everyone, it's, it's his jokes. Um, do you know what I mean? Yeah. They need each other to work as a trio and if you if runs out for comic relief in some sorts but he's really yeah, part he, of the trio sometimes it is i will admit sometimes it is does feel i feel like they could have a lot more lines with ron where he is not joking yeah because every yeah. single line he had was yeah was a joke so another difference we felt was that harry and how he compared from the script and the mm -hmm. into the play yeah because obviously ron has a, a less of a kind of characterisation mm. than Hirsch and Harry does. He has a massive arc. And I, when I read the, the script, I was absolutely disgusted at the way that they treated Harry and the way that Harry was... The way that Harry was acting was, for me, not what I envisioned him for, as, a, as a, an adult. Mm. It, it was... It almost felt like a betrayal because Harry is my, my favourite character. Harry in the script format, obviously his arc is that he really struggles as a father and as a result of that he makes some pretty bad choices. <laughs> Scenes especially that I've seen people not like and myself included when I read the script was the scene where he tells Albus that he wishes he wasn't yeah. his son. Which for me, reading the script format seemed incredibly blunt because the way, obviously it's just words on a page and I was... I just, I just can't understand the way that he treated McGonagall, the way that he treated Ginny, the way he completely ignored their views and abused his position and power to basically get his own way. It just seemed so undipl undiplomatic mm. and was not the Harry that I knew in the books. Okay. Watching the play, I mean, Jay Parker as Harry is book Harry. He is, he is him. We were both blown away by yeah, how incredible he was. For me, I, I wasn't sure about Harry whether I was looking forward to him because I was like, I don't really like Harry the way he, he acts in this. I was more there for the special effects and the magic. But the way that he acts Harry, the scene especially with Albus is incredibly different watching yeah. it. Because it's so emo emotional. You can see like he's really trying to connect, connect with Albus. Like when he says about, um, oh, he loves going back to Hogwarts and he meant that yeah. he's going to be Hermione again. And, he stopped, and then he stops himself and it just seems like you can really see the teenager inside of him. Yeah. And it's, oh, it's so emotional because you know you understand his struggle and you understand why and he just can't connect with his own son which for him is obviously must be incredibly emotional because a family is everything that he's ever wanted and now he's got it and it's pretty bittersweet yeah. and when he says that he wishes that was that Albus wasn't his son it seems like something he's just saying because Albus says it to him says it to him and it's just an in the moment thing and he progresses it immediately and you can you, see you can Albus. really tell yeah. how much he regrets yeah. it yeah. yeah it's incredible mm. Um, his his anger is a lot more like book Harry. Um, okay. We think that like kind of Daniel Radcliffe when he played Harry, it, it was a lot more muted. internal. Yeah, he's a lot more muted than the way he plays Harry, um, which is okay because it's it's a different medium. It's in it's in a, um, a film form, so you get yeah. to see those details. Whereas in a play, you don't get that. We were both on balcony seats, so we were you know you have out. to. You know they have to act quite like largely mm -hmm. so that everyone can see and everyone can understand what the motions um, they're trying to get. Yeah, book Harry is 
he gets incredibly angry a lot of the time, as we all know. He gets incredibly emotional, and that's something that we can get from the films. But in the play, Joe Parker, like as Harry, he gets so angry in in scenes mm. that you don't interpret Harry as being angry. He, he shouts, he screams, he cries. Like the scenes when were really emotional when he wakes up from oh, yes. um, those dreams, oh, and he's gosh. on the he's on, like in bed or he's on the stairs, and he's just like absolutely terrified. It's it's like it's like blood curdling scream, mm. and it's. It like runs through the entire theatre and it's absolutely terrifying. You just feel for Harry because he's going through so much. <laughs> I can't do it. Yeah. One thing you don't get from the script is just the transition scenes. Yeah. So you have scenes that transition from the Ministry of Magic to Hogwarts or whatever. And in our scenes, obviously, Harry is in a lot of them. So we have a lot of scenes where he just walks across the stage or he'll finish speaking and then he'll walk off. And they have these really cool lights and music and the way that Jamie Parker does. He has a strut. <laughs> just <laughs> demonstrate. He has. I just want to demonstrate. He just like walks with his hands. Oh my god, I'm too tall. Oh, like, he I'm walks sure with his hands in his pocket and he has his cloak and he swishes it <laughs> and he goes, but this is boots. And he has. <laughs> he has <gasps> such a serious face. And it's something that I've imagined Harry doing my entire life and I was so happy that I got to witness it. There's also a scene um, that. Jerry Parker plays with Harry that really was a scene that I absolutely sobbed at and a lot of the, the scenes I cried at but I'd also read in the script so it wasn't powerful but this was something that was in the script but it wasn't something that particularly affected me but seeing it was yeah it was emotional but um Harry it's after Harry has his second dream where he dreams that he's under the cupboard of the stairs and Petunia is also him about and he's being humiliated and you can you have the young Harry actor on the bottom of the stairs because they use stairs as a kind of set piece, don't they? That we should talk about. Um, yeah, we'll talk about the stairs yeah. in a minute. And, um, and so the young Harry is on the bottom on the cupboard under the stairs, and you have the older Harry on the top of the stairs, and he can see through. And um, it's, it's him waking up from a dream, and it's they're just staring at each other, and it's just so mm. emotional. Oh, it's God. so powerful yeah. and something you can sort of imagine that I guess when you read the script but seeing it on stage, seeing it come to life is mm -hmm. just, and um, yeah it's so atmospheric. So the staircases were used in a lot of other ways, um, so for example kind of when Albus and Scorpius aren't meant to be to get, be with each other, mm -hmm. um, they're on like the two staircases kind of dance around each other and they're like lingering and mm -hmm. everything. They were used so well because they were used to the um the scene with Hermione's bookcase. Hermione's bookcase scene was incredible. <gasps> oh my god! Oh, yes. It was like they had the hands coming out and the whole magic of it yeah. was so well done. So for example, the polyjuice potion <gasps> was like you literally had the kids on the stage and then suddenly like you know you're Jimmy Parker like <laughs> suddenly like, appearing behind that. <laughs> Sorry for him, he had so many scenes really and yeah, to get. I mean, obviously had to have a trap door or something. Yeah. We have the scene with Scorpius, um, and then the scene where he turns into Voldemort. Yeah. Because the thing is, because you know, when you watch the Harry Potter films, you're like, oh, it's a CGI, oh, it's, it's all fake. This cannot be faked in the same way yeah. that it can be in the films. And you know it's real, and you're actually like, how the hell did they manage to polyjuice yeah. with that? How is, is you know, that? I mean, reading the script, I was like, how the hell are they going to do this? Watching it three weeks later, I was like, how the hell have they done this? <laughs> and it, it was just the same reaction for both. It's just that awe that you get. And it's, the magic feels really real in a way that in the films it doesn't because mm. it's like you're only so far away from it. And um, also the telephone box was really cool. <gasps> and that's one of the first pieces of magic as well because mm. it's probably about you know, the third or fourth scene, I think. And at that point, we haven't had much magic yet. It's only been... The, uh, they've had the Hogwarts Express and King's Cross and everything. The first, the first piece of magic is when Harry goes into the telephone box. And um, the way, I don't know how to describe it, but he puts on a cloak. Yeah, and it has a hood. He wears it throughout the entire thing. Mm. Um, and it has a hood, so it covers his entire face and his entire body. And you have the telephone box, and he walks in, and there must be a trapdoor or something. The hat, the hat Because he's be not one. there, but then the, the cloak is still there, and you still think that he's there, and then all of a sudden, the, the telephone box kind of sucks in its cloak and it's not there. It's, 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 it's incredible. incredible. Yeah. We also liked how almost interactive it was. So, for example, when the whole scene with Delphi and you find her writings, 
they were the all around theatre walls were the writing like was it I am Voldemort's daughter or something mm. like that and it was in like UV and it they was projected just, some of it as well yeah sessions. and it was just like it's around you and it feels so real and you feel so immersed with that and yeah. even with the Dementors they were like swooping all the way across the they, whole we were in the, the audience we were yeah because I mean you do get a better experience if you're on stalls because you have Voldemort walk through things like that. Yeah. But you, so you kind of feel like you're missing out at that point. But then you have the Dementors come up. They are. The abs- they are terrified. Oh, I honestly thought they were going to come at me because you could oh. see, you could see like they were obviously on like wires, or whatever. And you, yeah. you're like, I was like, oh god, the wire comes by me. Is is one going to come and like into my face? It yeah, was terrifying. It was incredible. absolutely terrifying. Um, at the start of part one, you just have a normal voice telling you, you know, not to schedule like turn your phones off, yeah, I'm silent. Uh, no flash photography and then in the interval for part one you have Hermione say it and she go it's almost like a, a minister of magic kind of briefing she's like oh this is your minister of magic speaking yeah. please turn off all novel devices that may interfere with our like magical um, elements and things like that and it's, it just feels so real the way that they have those little tiny bits and also yeah. um, at the end I can't remember where was it with start of part two start of part two umbrage because obviously at the end of part one you're left with umbrage being like i'm back and everything's gone wrong in the new world and yeah. she comes in but we're hearing her voice you're suddenly reminded of everything which happened the previous day or earlier in that day i think one thing that you really don't get as well is the atmosphere of the actual mm-hmm. theater because you're all watching it together and um, it was more with you because you were in previews, but I yeah. didn't have as many shocks and things because people, a lot of people I'd already obviously talk about myself. Um, but you get people, audible shocks throughout the definitely, entire thing. Definitely. Um, um, I think for us, the most audible one was at the end of part one when Umbridge came on and was like, I'm yeah. like, I'm headmistress, what are you doing here? And everyone was like, oh my God. God. For me, the biggest one though was actually when Snape mentions that Cedric killed Neville, yes. and it's just in passing, yeah, yeah. and it's they're having an actual conversation, and so the, the actors actually have to stop. The other special effects which we liked were also the Patronuses. Mm-hmm. Now the way they did this was they had a, a puppet, and it was all dark in the back, and it was the animal was lit up with like fire, and you could just see it kind of coming, yeah, like, through the back, um, mm-hmm. and it was beautiful. It was everything a Patronus should be. And they were able to do that because of the stage, and you wouldn't ever, you wouldn't ever be able to do that in the actual film. I mean, it, it took guts because that's a pretty big fire hazard. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's what I was thinking the entire time. Um, um, but I, it was, it was absolutely beautiful, and it was a really interesting way to see how they adapted it to stage. I really liked the the time, the way that they showed the time turn. Yes. I wasn't expecting. That. Yes. Because you so, told me about the Patronus. But you had yeah, it. so the time travel was incredible. So it's like arches, the whole stage, the set, and um, when they go back in time, it kind of like goes like that. Um, they put a projection on and it makes you feel like you're going like that and it makes you feel like you're turning back yeah. in time. And the music? Um, they use uh, special effects for that one, but I think they also use like a time sort of ticking thing, yeah. which um, Imogen Heat does the composing for the... Uh, the play and a lot of the songs that you have are instrumental versions of different songs that she's done um hide and seek is one um i yeah. can't half life is for scorpius and albus um so you can google those and I, there's actually i think there's a playlist someone that's set up there are all instrumental versions that you can listen to but there are also a lot of extra other kind of different themes and different music that you get and it really enhances um the the scenes in ways that I've never actually seen before because it almost feels like you're watching a film because mm-hmm. when you're watching a film the scenes are really helped by the music and there's you know this dramatic music you don't really get that with like plays but they do that and it's really almost cinematic I think because I didn't notice the music specifically because like I said earlier I was taking it all in at once um, but even just having the music there really helped with the overall atmosphere and the mm-hmm. overall effect of the play it's very different from the Harry Potter soundtracks. Um, have like John Williams and all the really great mm. um, composers there and Imogen Heap's obviously primarily a, a singer yeah um, so I didn't know what I was expecting and it was it was really different but it really really worked it was uh, it's hard to talk about because obviously you can't hear music yeah um, but it's, it's great another thing I didn't really pick up on 
in like a major way as much as Imogen did was also the costumes. But like I said with the music, just the costumes as one really, really helps with the overall atmo not atmosphere yeah. but the overall like enjoyment of the play. Yeah, the costumes were, there was a lot of cloaks, a lot of wizarding kind of, uh, you know, that sort of aesthetic that you don't really get from the films. You get it from the first two films, you know, you have a lot of cloaks and a lot of uh, like witches hats and things like that, but from the later films you don't get that, it's just muggle clothing. Uh, but in uh, The Cursed Child you get an interesting mix of muggle clothing mixed with wizarding clothing. And what I thought was interesting was that... Um, Ginny and Ron are wearing primarily muggle clothing, coming from a wizarding background, but Harry and Hermione are wearing a lot of cloaks and a lot of very long clothing, which really reminds me of wizards, and they're coming from muggle backgrounds, which I thought was a very interesting kind of insinuation from the costume designer. What people are bitter about, us included, is Scorpius and Albus's relationship. Oh my God. So basically, J.K. Rowling on Jack Thorne and John Tiffany, and, you know, all of them, they, Scorpius and Albus's relationship was so obviously going to blossom into something romantic. Like, if they were a straight couple or a straight friend, they would have become romantically interested in one another. Yeah. But, come to the end of the play, and everyone's like, they're going to get together, are they going to get together? Scorpius, who's been assassin with Rose all of it, comes out and goes, I can't believe I just did that. I can't believe I asked out Rose Granger Weasley. I read in the script, I think it just felt like a disappointment in a way. But they have a relationship that is so unlike anything else that we've ever seen. They're so Harry close with one another and so open. Yeah. I mean, I guess the other kind of, um, I said like bromance, if they want us to consider it that, yeah. um, a relationship really is Harry and Ron. Even they aren't that close. Like, Brett, Scorpius, and Albus, they're so in tune with each other. Because I think they're, they're, they're each other's only friend. Yeah. Whereas, kind of, Harry and Ron had Hermione, and they had yeah. the Weasleys. Yeah. Whereas they feel so isolated. Yeah. They're just. I think. I just feel so cheated. They had the opportunity you know to do something incredible, and you know, put have included a LGBT couple in something which is so famous. Yet they just didn't, and yeah. it's hard to see why they didn't. I when do, it was so, when it was written in such an obvious way. Yeah, and I do think that my enjoyment of the script mm. would have been dramatically increased if I had read that because it would have been so refreshing to see a couple like that in such a famous series. And let's just say that that's probably the part of the Cursed Child canon that I'm going to be ignoring the most, yeah. even more than Delphi's yeah. existence. Uh, the fact that Scorbis is a canon, I shall be ignoring that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, so Ginny, I was not a fan of her in the play. Um, I felt like she had a few good lines, you know, being like, he's my son too, I think that's one of them. Um, yeah. But overall, she just kind of was there mm -hmm. to kind of, she was to be, she was there as like, for Harry rather than in her own right as her own character and you know Harry would just kind of like lean on her and use her like for advice and everything um, and she wasn't really as active as I hoped she'd be. Yeah Ginny was like an interesting one because obviously I've said that Harry and Ron were people that very much differed in the script and that they're much better in the play but I felt that Ginny was lacking in the actual play and was a lot better in the script. Um, I'm not sure, I think she was, it was purely because she was overshadowed by a lot of mm. the other characters that had a lot longer, like, a bigger stage presence. Um, they didn't cut any of her lines, um, I think it was more that she had, it was weird, she had a lot of bursts of really cool moments. Yeah. But then other moments she was really lacking, the exploding snap scene at the end, the talk between her and Harry, I thought was really powerful, really emotional. Mm. Scenes where she kind of mentioned Tom Riddle, um, which was really was really cool. It, you kind of wish that she went more into Tom Riddle yeah. and more into her experience that she had in her first year. I think they definitely could have because I think the way that Delphi manipulates Albus, her mm. own son, is incredibly similar and it's a purposeful mirroring of her and Tom Riddle. And I feel she definitely had an arc there, especially mm. her with Harry as well. And it was just not explored. The, and I think so much potential which they just kind of brushed yeah. aside and focused more on kind of Harry 
Yeah. Which is a bit, it is a shame. In the script though, I, I definitely got an impression that I was really looking forward to her. And I, I loved her in the script, because definitely out of all of the eight stories, I mean that's definitely the one that she is most present in, is yeah. The Fresh Child. Um, but in the play, I just, I just felt like she was kind of off. I know, I, I think that, I know this is kind of controversial, but um, I thought mm. that um, Draco's screen time definitely could have been reduced a lot more for, for Ginny because out of the five of them she definitely got the less kind of stage presence. Hermione was another one, uh, she didn't translate as well in the script when I read her. I was kind of, I don't know, I was kind of unsure about her. I, she didn't have much of a arc. It kind of centred around the fact that if she wasn't with Ron she basically became Snape mm -hmm. like he was with Lily. Which was a purposeful mirroring of that and I didn't like yeah. it. Yeah. Um, I didn't, we didn't like Snape. Full stop. Never have. Never oh will. Jake Rowling trying to redeem him again was just. Do you know the the worst line in the entire play, and it still it was even worse watching it was. Tell Albus Severus I'm glad that he pr he carries my name. Oh, oh no. <laughs> oh, I mean when it when um Scorpius went up to Snape and he was like, oh Snape, you're such a war hero. This is an honour. <laughs> Boy was amazing as Scorpius, but even he couldn't save that line. I could just never be okay with Snape <laughs> yeah, returning yeah, anything, so it felt very like much like fan service. Um, yeah, unfortunately, this fan was not satisfied. <laughs> no, I just ignored that entire segment of yeah, the play. Yeah, I'm I really, really, really enjoyed the play. I'm seeing it again in January. Um, I'm lucky enough to go, and I genuinely enjoyed it. I mean it was one of like the best experiences. Yeah. I agree. It was it was it was just incredible. I think it was the mad the all of the magic and the atmosphere of the theatre, the cheers, the laughs, just the Every, everything as a whole when it was all brought together, which you don't get in the script, was just an no. incredible experience. It's almost, it's almost like the script is a part of the puzzle piece that makes yeah. the first child. Mm -hmm. And there are so many aspects like the music and the costumes and the portrayals and the the sets and the choreography and it all just comes together beautifully and the script is really it's it's just you, nothing. You, sh you shouldn't focus on the script. I know it's hard to say because obviously not many people have actually had the luckily enough to have the chance to go see it. But the script isn't what you should be necessarily focusing on, and the plot isn't the be all and end all if it's a rubbish mm. plot because the other parts of the production really make up for it. Yeah, I think that. Overall, I'm, I'm happy that it exists. Yeah. I'd rather it not exist, but I know a lot of people are like, why the hell does this exist? And everyone has the right to think that because 99% of the people, or 99% of the fans, are only going to be able to experience this via the script. So everyone gets the right to just conclude their, their feelings on the first child via the script. I, I think also what helps is that you get kind of a bit of domestic Harry and Ginny and Ron and Hermione, and it's just yeah, like, we, that's what I really wanted to find more about. And the fact that Harry does the cooking, they're on a sugar free diet, it's just little it's things like that. Pigeons. Oh, yeah. Um, um, those are things that I'd been wondering for so long after like finishing Harry Potter War in like 2007. Yeah. And so to get this and to see it was really, really refreshing. Reading it was like that as well. That's probably one of the parts that I really enjoyed. Um, watching it was just added because you get the sets and the costumes and things and it's really great. But I definitely think that I have a newfound appreciation for the actors because it, yeah. it's so, it looks so hard mm. to to kind of balance the magic and also the the acting because there are a lot of challenging scenes especially with Albus Scorpius mm -hmm. and Harry I think they have like the most challenging scenes um, but what's good I think about Cursed Child being a play is that like people say you know Harry Potter got a whole generation of children into reading and I feel like Cursed Child got a whole generation mm -hmm. um into into going to the theatre a lot more often which is really important because I think going to the theatre is such an amazing experience. Mm -hmm. That was our first episode of Quality, <laughs> a chat between me and Imogen yeah. about The Cursed Child. If you have seen it, if you just read the script, you know, what are your thoughts on it? Leave a comment down below and we will see you soon. Goodbye. Bye.